Welcome to the first episode of the Joy Shtick. No, I do not have an accent. I'm giving you my shtick on games and the like. Today I'm going to be talking about competitive gaming as a whole, uh, focusing on a couple of games uh, in particular. First off, I want to talk about uh, the Winter Olympics just ended. And uh, they actually had a couple StarCraft players that played in an event that it wasn't directly in the Olympics, but it, it was an Olympics sponsored event. We had an esports technically in the Olympics, which to me blows my mind. Um, I'm glad that they've realized that these sort of games take this sort of skill and finesse that can be compared to an Olympic level sport. Like it's it's taken a while. Um, to be fair, the the esports scene hasn't been around as long as obviously some of these games have, but it's been growing at an alarming rate. Uh, they also had a few uh, Korean League of Legends players walk out with South Korea. I'm not sure who. Uh, might have been a couple TSM players. I'm sure Faker was probably out there. Um, but in general, uh, the Olympics and esports, like, could it happen on a, on a more global scale? Because obviously StarCraft is just one of many games that could be considered to be an Olympic-level um competition you know obviously you have a couple games i'm going to be talking about today uh league of legends and dota are up there csgo maybe um but things like that just they have the potential to grow to the point where they could be shown on a global scale and not just for for the twitch viewers or the you know the youtube viewers wherever you're watching the live stream but anybody who understands sports as a whole and understands the whole competitiveness behind competing in something like that has to for me just feels like it they would just get uh competitive esports um i'm just not sure if right now the olympics has the the kind of pull that you would need to um to get to that level where it would be acceptable like obviously everybody loves you know uh seeing usain bolt run uh I, i'm not sure if he's retired uh, from the Olympics or not. I doubt he is. But everybody loves seeing him run in the 100. Everybody loves seeing, you know, all the big sports, basketball. Everybody loves watching, like, the World Baseball Classic. But there's not that same sort of country pride, at least not on a, on a, on a, na on a national scale, that you would have for an eSport. Because people don't see that sort of connection with these people I, I don't know if it's because they don't know them or a lot of people just view video games as something you know kids do in their free time and it's a waste of time whatever um but and also you have teams that aren't you know single nations so i guess you know you'd have to split everybody up in, into into their specific nationality in which case you know certain games south korea and some of the uh more eastern countries would probably kill league of legends the, the European teams would absolutely destroy CS. Um, but I think I think if you... You need to start that competition somewhere else. I don't think you can start with the Olympics for uh, national esports. You need to have a smaller competition. And when people can see that it's a possibility to, to work, then you can start to move it up, up to the Olympics. So for, for me, it, it could be there. It's just not there yet. Um, something that is on the rise, though, recently, uh, PUBG, or Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, if you're unfamiliar, um, they had a tournament, it was, it was a few months ago now, it was in November, it was IEM, I believe it was Oakland, yeah, IEM Oakland, uh, where they had a $200,000 prize pool for a, for a game that had come out, I think, within the year, which boggles my mind, um, that it could grow that quickly. Something that they changed, I was reading an article on it, they changed some of the, the few key aspects of the game which for me make it a little less fun in just regular casual play um the big thing for me was there's no clothing drops for the players and there's no red zone red zone i get the point of it in in regular casual play um it's to force people to move but when you're supposed to be playing a game that is based on skill and there is an RNG aspect of the game that can affect the game for you personally or on a grander scale of the match as a whole to that level where you're forced to either move 
out of the red zone and possibly into another team or individual, depending on the game mode you're playing, or get killed by it. That just seems like something that needs to be taken out completely. And I'm glad they do it for the professional events. That's a great step. But for, for me personally, I just want to get rid of it. It just doesn't seem like there's a point to have the red zone for me. Um, another thing that me and my roommate were talking about is, is the zone, the blue, uh, and what potential changes they could make to that. Uh, now I do agree that there should be some randomness in the blue, like it shouldn't spawn in the center of the, uh, of the map, whether it be Miramar or Miramar or Erangel, and just kind of slowly get smaller on the same point. There needs to be some sort of variance. Um, and what I was saying to my roommate and what we kind of agreed as would be like a good distance would be about once it gets underneath a kilometer's diameter so once the circle's within a kilometer then the variance sort of stops there's still a little bit of movement but like you wouldn't get the zones that are touching one side of the circle so if you're on the other side of the circle you have to fight with all these other you know three four teams or nine ten individuals towards the circle while the four people that are in the circle are fine they don't have to move that's not fair because then you're getting rng'd uh and i see that as a way worse problem than the red zone uh, for casual and competitive play. Obviously, when you're a pro, it's going to be a lot different because you're going to be able to compensate. Your aim is just way better, and your game sense is just top of the line. But it just, it seems like something that needs to be tweaked for me. Um, something else that this article talked about was, obviously, the games are played in first person only. Third person only is a joke, in my opinion. If you play third person, I'm not saying you're bad. You, you're, you're probably decent at the game, or maybe you're not. There's probably a few shitters out there. Um, but the, the corner peeking and the information that you get when you're playing in a third-person perspective makes the game less competitive. If you can corner peek somebody, you know, and watch them run around an entire town without them ever seeing you, that's not fair. That's basically giving you... It's like pseudo wall hacks, in my opinion. Because then you could jump out. Obviously, if you're playing with sound, that's a different story. If you hear them coming and you jump out of them... Kudos to you. I do that in CSGO all the time. But if you're if you're corner peeking, you know, and you see somebody run up a stone wall, you vault over that wall, and then you shoot them in the back without them ever knowing you were there, that just doesn't seem like a fair a level playing field to me. And I'm glad that they, they don't play third person in the pro matches. I don't think they ever would have considered it. It, it was just something, it was a little, nice little uh, tidbit to me. I was like, oh, okay, good. They recognize that it's better. Um... Another thing that I noticed was at IEM Oakland, the winners of the tournament was this team called, it was AAA, which stood for, uh, where is it? It stood for Against All Authority. And this is a team that qualified for the event from an outside tournament. It wasn't one of the teams that got invited, like Tempo Storm or FaZe or, or TSM. They, they, they built their way up. You know, these are just four guys or girls, I'm honestly not sure. Uh, who were just really good at the game, and they came to this tournament, and they won 60, 60 grand as a team. Uh, which I think is great for the competitive scene. You know, you look at uh, professional sports specifically, um, and if you're if you're looking in the scope of the United States, it's tough to compare. But I like to, th if you think of it, of it on a global scale, you know, we we're talking about, like, uh, soccer, or, or football, sorry. <laughs> if you're looking at soccer... There is a promotion and relegation system in many leagues nowadays, or in almost all the leagues that I can think of, um, except for the MLS, that basically if you do poorly, you get dropped down to the second tier. It'd be like, for, for those of you who are like MLB or NBA fans, it'd be like if the two worst teams in the NBA or the MLB got dropped down to like Triple A or the D League, and then the, the best two teams from the Triple A or the D League came up to the NBA. It's, it's great for competitiveness because, you know, teams aren't, they're not safe in the sense that you know that your position in the league isn't going to change. You know, sure, maybe you pull a Rams and you pick up and move cities, but you're not going to stop being an NFL team. When you have this promotion relegation system like these soccer leagues do, it gives that, that not only does it give motivation for teams to stay up when you get into the top division, but it gives lower teams motivation to keep trying. You know, players aren't just playing so that they can get to the best team. Players are playing, hopefully, so that they can bring their team up to the top level. And when you can bring a team like this uh, against all authority out of essentially nowhere, um, 
and they rise and they win you know what could pros probably is the first big PUBG tournament ever that's just it it says good things about what the scene is probably going to be in my opinion I'm a little biased I love PUBG but for me it just seems like it's on a it's on an upward sh trajectory now the other big the other big battle royale game that's out right now is Fortnite and Fortnite, for me, obviously that it does have a competitive scene. I'm not taking away from the skill that some people possess in this game. But for me, there are a few telltale signs that liken it more to H1Z1 for me than towards what PUBG looks like becoming. Um, first of all, Bloom. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, Bloom is a shooting mechanic. Uh, if... If you're, um, I'm sure you're aware of, like, Call of Duty or Counter-Strike, which has what's called a hitscan. Uh, and hitscan is when you, you know, press mouse one or you hit the trigger for your, for your gun to go off, the bullet registers automatically whether it's a hit or not. Uh, Bloom is an effect that is, uh, that is pretty much only paired with, um, with non-hitscan or travel time games, where bullets have travel time. PUBG has travel time, but does not have Bloom. Uh, essentially what Bloom is, is it makes your aim kind of like you're shooting in a, in a elongated cone. So your first bullet will travel somewhere in this tiny cone, and as you shoot or move, the cone gets progressively larger. So the, the area your bullet could travel gets progressively larger. So you could be aiming right at their head in the middle of your crosshair, but it goes up and to the left. Now, I'm not saying that people who are moving should have 100% accuracy because, you know, games like that, you end up like Call of Duty, which is now, as you can probably tell, is dying off, in my opinion, because it's just become unoriginal and repetitive at this point. But when you have Bloom, it, t it adds that, again, that element of RNG that I just so dislike in a game that I'm trying to be competitive in. It, it, Fortnite does have a lot of positives. Um, there are a lot more viable weapons in Fortnite. And now, you know, people will probably bring up, well, let's say the double pump, which is a mechanic that they're, they're fixing. But basically what it allowed you to do was if you ran two pump shotguns, you could switch between them faster than you could cock them. And so you, you shoot with the first one, switch to the second one, shoot again, and you switch to the first one, you didn't have to re-cock it. So you could essentially shoot, I think it was like four rounds in the time of which you would supposed to be shooting three slugs i don't know if it was that uh extreme but it was it was definitely faster and what this allowed players to do was it you know it took advantage of an aspect of the game that wasn't supposed to be in which you know fair play obviously if it's in the game and it's not you know a win all glitch where it's like invisibility or something sure go ahead use it but it added a, I for, there's an article I had for it, um, I'm not sure where it is. It said, uh, it said that it was, um, it made, it makes the weapon stronger than intended by bypassing a weakness that, you know, was supposed to be that pump. And when you have a gun that ends up being more powerful than it is supposed to be, that it does the game becomes unbalanced no matter how balanced the rest of the game is you know you look at um you look at i think it's destiny when the gallerhorn was first released i don't know a lot about destiny but i know that when the gallerhorn was released destiny imploded like it was like a week and a half where the game just stopped like everything stopped everybody was losing their shit over the gallerhorn or or aug week in csgo when the aug was just completely broken um Fortnite also has building. I love the building mechanic in Fortnite. It's the only, well, I wouldn't say it's the only redeeming quality. It's one of the main redeeming qualities of the game for me, but I think they need it. There's not enough natural cover, and that natural cover which exists can be destroyed. So, you know, who wants to have a gunfight um, where there's no natural cover because Fortnite is relatively flat? You know, you wouldn't want to be running at each other across an open field with no cover. And while that will happen from time to time in PUBG, a lot of times games are going to end with some natural with some natural cover, a building, you know, trees, some some rocks. In uh, Miramar, there's a lot more hills, a lot more things you can use 
as far as terrain goes. So the building mechanic, and you can, it brings in a level of outplay into Fortnite that you don't have in PUBG, uh, where you can out mind game somebody by building certain structures or, you know, the, uh, the wall traps or the floor traps using uh, springboards to get to farther places to get around people. I love that mechanic of it because it is all about using your knowledge and skill of the game to outclass your opponent. Um, Fortnite games are also a lot quicker, um, and while I will say that it's great to sit down and play a game of PUBG, I'm not always ready to commit 25 minutes to a single game where I get two kills and I, I end up third place. So, if I can sit down and play a game of Fortnite, and I can play three games in 30 minutes, and twice I come in second, and I come in, like, tenth the other game, I'm good with that. The issue becomes, uh, the loot distribution then becomes uh skewed to those people who are willing to take the risk to go to the high volume areas if you go to like uh say snobby shores on the west coast there's i think four buildings five buildings there so you're not going to get um as far as numbers go you're not going to get as much loot you may get good loot because you know rng but it's not going to be as likely as saying going to tilted towers um, that's the issue I have is where if you're playing a competitive game of Fortnite, chances are you're going to land somewhere with somebody else. There's not enough places that everybody could spread out and get some sort of loot before getting into a gunfight. Because if I lose a gunfight because he had a gun and I didn't, that's out of my control. And I cannot stand when that happens. Um, also it seems like Fortnite has less hackers. I don't know. Um, I've never seen a hacker in Fortnite, but the amount of time I've played PUBG compared to the amount of time I've, I've played Fortnite is just not comparable. So there may be hackers in Fortnite, I'm just not aware of them. Uh, in PUBG, like I said, less RNG. Um, the jumping mechanic in Fortnite annoys me to no end. I cannot stand the fact that you can jump and be just as accurate as if you were standing on the ground. Just doesn't, this seems like it doesn't take any skill. That's just my opinion. Uh, no bloom, like I mentioned before. The, the, the existence of bloom in pub, in, uh, in Fortnite, excuse me, just, it, it just, it, it makes sense for the game, but it's, the mechanic of bloom itself is nonsensical, in, in my opinion. And, and more versatile. PUBG is way more versatile. There are so many different play styles you can play in PUBG. That, and they will all have a chance of winning. You could play super aggressive like some of the streamers do. Shroud in particular. Play super aggressive in PUBG because he's just, he can outgun people. You could play, you know, the sneaky game and sneak around people and be, you know, snake in the grass type person. Get one kill and it's the person who came in second and you win the game. You could play medium, you know, take fights when you when you need to. Play defensively when, when you have to. Um... And win the game just as just the same as the other two. So for me, and Fortnite, it kind of seems like if you're playing passive, you are losing ground on those who are playing more aggressive. Not super aggressive, but there, there needs to be... I feel like Fortnite is the game where the middle ground works the best. You play aggressive a little bit, you play passive a little bit, you build your base, you snipe people out of it, you shoot rocket launchers. That's another thing. The rocket launcher and the minigun need to be some some way balanced. It's just like the... If you have a rocket launcher end game and you have 15 rockets, say, and there's four people left, as long as you don't get shot in the back, you're basically guaranteeing yourself a victory. And... Just, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of mechanics in Fortnite that I that turn me off of the game because it just seems like you won because you got something I didn't. And if, in you know, for instance, if we're comparing the rifles in PUBG, AKM, M16, M416, and the SCAR are the main ones. Obviously, you have the DP28 uh, as well, but you don't really run into that one as often. So we'll look at the four main ones. The three ones that take 5.56... And the 762 weapon. They're pretty much all the same. You know, obviously, I think there's a slight damage difference in them, and I'm not sure exactly what the 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 number difference is, but it's negligible. Um, so if you find one of those four, you're about as set as if you found one of the other three in comparison. 
the tiered weapon system that Fortnite has in the sense that rarity of guns is a factor in you progressing as far as like damage output is insanely annoying because if i find a assault rifle a gray assault rifle and you know like a green pump shotgun i could get outgunned by somebody who found a blue rifle and a and a purple pump shotgun even though they're theoretically the same weapons but they do more damage because he found a different rarity of it that to me it just the the whole rarity aspect doesn't it just i, I don't know the the perfect way to describe it uh, how i think about it in my head but i feel like rarity is more suited for loot boxes and not for not for thing things that are um that are skill based Okay, um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time talking about uh, PUBG and Fortnite. I'm going to move on a little bit to uh, Dota and League of Legends. What happened? And by that, I mean, what happened to Dota? You know, you you talk about you know, even four years ago, Dota was the superior game to League of Legends in the sense that it was way more popular. Um, you know, Dota still has the bigger prize pools, but that's because it's backed by Valve. And they do a lot of crowdfunding for the uh, for the final prize pool. But League of Legends has done a few key things way better than Dota, which has made their game take off in a significant way as far as spectator sports go. And a lot a lot of these games, like PUBG and Fortnite, aren't really spectator sports yet. Um, but I, I lol. League of Legends and CSGO, obviously. FIFA, which I'm going to talk about towards the end, is kind of getting there, but you'll you'll see what, what my opinions are uh, on FIFA towards towards the end of this podcast. But um, if you look at the, the just the player numbers of Dota versus League of Legends, uh, these numbers are about uh, nine months old, but they can't have changed that much. Dota has about 13.5 million players uh, total, and League of Legends has about 100 million total. Uh, that, the difference there, just right off the bat, makes me feel like League of Legends is more newbie friendly. And I don't mean like friendly to noobs, I mean if you've never picked up the game before, you feel more inclined to try to play it because it is, like, it's a pretty game to look at. The graphics are nice, they're, they're vibrant colors. You feel welcome when you, when you first log in and you pick, you know, one of your three starting characters and you jump into the Howling Abyss. You feel like you're in a movie almost, and you're playing this, you know, I picked Ash when I first started off. So you feel like you're playing this uh, skillful uh, bow, bow woman who is going to, you know, defeat all the bad guys. And it, 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 it excited me. Um, the, the Dota is way harder for a casual player to pick up and for a, a, a new player. So, and... and because of that, you could argue, hey, maybe Dota's more skill-based. It's a lot more nuanced. Uh, there are more things to worry about. Sure, you could argue that. Um, and I would be intent. I would be inclined to agree with you on, on that. Uh, I just think that when you're talking about Dota versus League of Legends, the the differences are so minute on a on a grand scale that those the difficulty level as far as once you get to the pro scene is almost the same, you know, where it becomes almost non-existent to the fact that, you know, a Dota player probably is about as skilled at what he does as a pro League of Legends player. Um, Dota, like I said before, uh, League of Legends is a pretty game. Dota's a little bit harder to watch, not only because there's a lot more going on and the graphics aren't um, as... They don't, they don't hit your eyes uh nicely you know and they're not harsh by any stretch of the imagination it's just a little more what's the word they don't it, it feels like there's just so much stuff going on it feels like you're watching a michael bay explosion when a dota fight breaks out league of legends you can kind of trace certain things you can watch a player uh, or a character do a champion do certain things in the fight dota just kind of feels like to me personally it feels like a giant mosh pit of everybody just pressing all the keys on their keyboard and somebody comes out the victor and i understand that it's more nuanced than that and i'm kind of just being a bit of a dick right now to the dota players but yeah <laughs> um dota's also kind of missed the spectator aspect as far as 
uh, appealing to an audience. Um, you know, me and my roommate were talking before, and he said, yeah, my friends always ask me, they're like, oh, did you watch Worlds? Uh, in reference to League of Legends, but they never talk about the International, which is kind of like the, uh, Dota's uh, counterpart. Also, the one thing that did I did mention before about uh, prize pools, it sits more on the competitor side. That's not so much uh, a concern of a of a casual viewer or even a uh, even a dedicated viewer. But for instance, the last international for Dota garnered twenty million ish total U.S. dollars for all the competitors. League of Legends, on the other hand, had about 4 million U.S. dollars, but League of Legends also had 60 million viewers total for the final, like, for the entire competition. Um, and so, uh, just a little stat I'm going to throw out here. It's not a stat. It's more like a tidbit, but uh, it'll be important later. Uh, Dota 2 was released in 2013, and League of Legends was released in 2009. PUBG and Fortnite are both within the past year. That will become important at the end, especially when I'm talking about FIFA. The next game I'm going to talk about is personally my favorite game, possibly of all time, definitely within the past year, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, or CSGO, as I'm sure a few of you know it. Um, do they play too much? Do professional CSGO players play too much CSGO? And obviously the answer is like, well, no, it's their job. They can't play enough. Uh, I would disagree. The amount of tournaments and just moving around that these players do has to be taxing on them. The, you know, the constant flying from place to place. You know, uh, the major in Boston was, I don't know, two weeks ago. And there was, they're having another tournament over for the Star League. I'm not sure where that is. I think it's in Europe, though. There's another tournament in, like, Scandinavia or something going on. And these players are just all over the, they're traveling like international businessmen. And on top of that, they're spending probably more than half their day doing something involving this game, watching footage, uh, playing the game itself, do, uh, speaking to their coaches about uh, tactics and strategies. They, they basically, it becomes the game first, them second. And in that aspect, yes, I think they play too much. And obviously, they played a certain amount to get to the top level, which is probably what, you know, the amount they're playing right now. It just seems like so much to me. And I don't know how, what it is in other esports as far as like playtime for professionals. CSGO is the one I watch most avidly. It just... It, I, I feel like they're, they're running themselves into the ground with the amount of time they put into their work. Um, I actually went to a, a CSGO event. Uh, I went to I, IEM? No. ESL1 New York. Uh, back in 2017 in September had a phenomenal time. I loved the experience there uh, The Barclays Center was a great Venue for that kind of event and I, I thoroughly enjoyed watching the event live um, For those of you who are, are up and up on the CSGO uh, pro scene uh, It was the tournament that I think FaZe beat Cloud9 in the final um, But Liquid had a phenomenal performance in this in the uh, the quarterfinals uh, and there was there's a great kill where I think JDM gets a double kill on two people sitting on coffins on Inferno. This is, you know, a nuanced uh, portion of the map as far as, like, if you're not aware. So you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Basically, he got he, he got a, a pretty important double kill with one shot uh, of the sniper or the, the AWP. Um, and won them a huge round. And the crowd just erupted. And it, it I felt like I was at a sporting event because, I mean, you know, I was... But not in the traditional sense. Uh, the the closest thing I can compare it to is I'm a, I'm a huge Yankees fan. I went to game four of the ALCS against the Houston Astros. And when they took the lead in the in the eighth inning, the stadium was probably... It was, it was louder than uh, the Barclays Center, but it was comparable. And to me, that says a lot about where the pro competitive, the pro competitive scene specifically for CSGO and as a live spectator sport, where it's going. And it can only go up because if you look back in like, I think it was 2015, if you look back at the I Buy Power scandal with, uh, you know, Steel, uh, Dazed, ACK, Brax, you feel for those guys, man, sometimes. Sometimes you feel for those guys, other times 
you, you think they got what they deserve. Um, but, like, who fixes a match, man? Like, for, for skins? I, you know, I, I know I understand it's, it's actual money. But they, they almost, in my opinion, they almost destroyed the competitive CSGO scene with that scandal. Obviously, Valve did the right thing, which was immediately and permanently banning them. Um, because if they had let them continue, that that's it. That's game over for, for CSGO as a competitive esport. That's the end, you know. Uh, and the main thing that, in my opinion, drove CSGO to where it is now, I don't think it keeps it there, but I think what's, what got it to that peak... Uh, to where it really started to, to hit on a global scale was skins and skins gambling because people love skins and people love to gamble because they're idiots and I'm an idiot and I love to gamble. But <laughs> um, there was another scandal in the gambling scene as too with Syndicate and T-Mart and gambling on their own site. Um, and people could say no press is bad press. You look at Logan Paul, Jesus, Logan Paul with his bullshit going on, taping dead bodies in the woods. Come on, dude. But you can look at his, look at his statistics. Look at his social blade. He shot up in subscribers. He dipped initially, but he's back up. He's up. He's going to continue going up until he does something apparently even more stupid than that. So, you know, these two scandals, while they may have been bad initially, uh, I think overall have contributed to the, um the overall, you know, uh, public awareness of CSGO and CSGO skins and, and what that adds to, um, and how skins add to CSGO as a competitive, uh, scene to the fact that it's almost as if you as a, uh, casual viewer can be like the pros if you gamble some skins. You don't do that. Don't, don't gamble skins ever. I don't care if you're 18, if you're 40, if you're, don't, don't gamble. It's a bad idea. If you're, if you're of legal age, you can, you can think for yourself, but don't do it. It's a bad idea. Um, but yeah, you know, you get some of those skins, you're like, oh man, uh, you know, Shroud's got the howl, dude. I can be just like Shroud if I get a howl and maybe I'll be as good as Shroud. Um, and one thing that you could say about CSGO, they're aesthetic and that's it. They don't affect the gameplay at all, which I love, you know. I don't mind dropping a bunch of money on a game that I support. You know, I paid 20, 20 or 15 bucks for it, whatever it costs. I don't mind supporting a game that I love through cosmetic uh, altercations to things. What I do have a problem with, and we're getting to this now, my favorite game, FIFA. EA Sports. It's in the money. It's always about the money for EA Sports. Those bastards. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I was saying... Hmm. Excuse me. Like I was saying, I don't mind paying money for cosmetic changes to, to things. What I do have a problem with is paying money for things that alter your gameplay, like FIFA. You can buy FIFA points for the low, low price of up to a hundred US dollars and maybe get something good out of a pack so you can put them in your team. Bullshit. It's bullshit. EA know what they're doing with this game. They know what they did in the past and how it's not going to stop working and they're going to continue to do it because they can. That's the only reason they're doing it, because they can. They have no reason to stop. People keep putting money into the game despite the, the vast outcry from the FIFA community about how shit the game is and how they've got to improve stuff, otherwise they're going in the trash can. They continue making money. They make over half a billion dollars alone on microtransactions just from FIFA, not even counting Madden and their other games. <sighs> not to mention the gameplay itself is horrendous. It's, it's bad, okay? The Frostbite system just doesn't work with, with FIFA. It doesn't. The Frostbite engine just doesn't work with FIFA. And let me tell you why. Something about the Frostbite engine, and I'm not sure I'm you know, I'm majoring in computer science, but I know, I know the basic level of coding. I barely, you know, I can barely write a, a class function. Um, I don't know how coding works as far as like how you get the ball to bounce certain ways or, you know, ball, the ball is sticking at somebody's feet when they're dribbling. But it seems to me that the, the mechanic with, with the ball has something to do with having to always be traveling in the direction of a player. As if, like, the ball is an entity that can only travel between two players' dots.
dots. You know, you can imagine two players as a dot. The ball is like a as, a as a third dot, and the ball has to be somewhere between that line. You know, it can't be off to the side where you could have two defenders uh, running equally to try to, you know, go at it 50-50. Uh, and the reason I say that is because, you know, the amount of rebounds you can you concede in this game, the amount that the ball will just trickle away for no reason. And these two, t these two reasons, combined with the third one, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, is the reason this game will not work competitively, in my opinion. It it kind of did uh, the past year and a half. They got some big names from YouTube, which are kind of keeping it afloat. They got Spencer, they got Castro, they got Chew Boy. Those people, in my opinion, are the only reason that FIFA is staying competitive. The third reason that this game isn't going to work is the yearly EA cycle. And you'll remember, I mentioned PUBG and Fortnite released this year. But, you know, hooray, we're not going to get a PUBG or Fortnite 2 anytime soon. Dota and League of Legends. Dota was Dota 2 was 2013. League of Legends 2009. CSGO 2014. FIFA. A yearly release in which all of the money you sunk into that previous year's game means nothing. Means nothing. So you're basically throwing money at digital pixels, you know, that will become useless in nine months. And they know what they're doing, and they're continuing to get away with it because we continue to funnel money into the game like the little sheep we are. And uh, <laughs> the game will not progress. It will start to regress if you look at the number of pro players that are quitting, that are taking breaks, because the game is too taxing to play. And the amount of randomness, the pay-to-win... And the yearly cycle all are going to contribute to FIFA's detriment as an esport if, if, if EA doesn't change something. If they can change the game, so, you know, it's in the game. Yeah, make it about the game. Don't make it about the microtransactions that you're sapping your consumers for. Make it about the gameplay. Make it about the game of soccer. <sighs> All right, um, that's going to be it for me today. You can find me on Twitter at Boren Ultimatum. Uh, you can follow my Instagram as well, same username. Uh, this has been the Joy Shtick. Uh, I will be back next Wednesday at 12. Uh, hard games, are they too hard? Uh, we'll discuss that and some more things uh, next Tuesday. See you then.